Hello, retro fans. Welcome to another, well, tinkering creation session. And, um, well, basically, the idea I had in mind was born, well, months, years ago, because I started to use more than one C64 in my setup especially for making, let's say, music. And the main thing is that, um, I mean, you run into the same problem probably as well. If you have uh, multiple computers connected to one, let's say, monitor, TV, whatever, then uh, you have the issue that uh, you either start to reconnect the device you want to use or you use some sort of uh, video switchers and um, this is basically the same approach I have taken and um, I ended up using a device that looks basically like this so this is a very huge box and you can connect your uh, YC uh, slash S video connectors here or you use your composite and um, in addition the audio signals and you have basically four ins and one out and then you have this very sort of mechanical buttons to switch between the sources and um, well to be honest this is not really what I was looking for and um, when I was recreating or let's say creating a whole new setup for my uh, C64s I had in mind to build something new and uh, today it's about the progress how we got there and uh, how it looks at the end. So, and uh, one major thing or one additional thing I was going to address is basically using this device I have present already is one thing but um, I'll, I, I still end up with an um, YC signal at the end but uh, most of the time if not always I'm using some HDMI devices and in my former setup I have used this little box from uh, Ligavu whatever which converts that's the wrong box but the other one looks the same <laughs> I'm sorry <laughs> I just recognized that this isn't the uh, YC box that's the YPBPR box but the other one looks the very same and um, I had those little, um, oh, not so little devices stacked on top of each other and if you are familiar with HDMI cables and uh, with uh, let's say YC cables with a certain aspect of quality you may know that they are very very stiff most of the time. So uh, I ended up with a setup that was almost always all the time very much dearranged and not very stable. So I may have used some mob zippers or something like this to attach this to each other or just glue it to, it to each other. But I thought, nope, this time it's time to create something new. And um, today it's going to be about this. And as a very first thing I thought, okay, when I have the ability to switch signals and I want to combine this with an, um, two HDMI converter, what would be a nice thing? And um, I'm really a little bit confused that I have the wrong box in my hand, but uh, well, anyway. So I thought whether I take the other box and I uh, use the electronics from this uh, box and um, combine this in one case 
but uh, this was for my taste still a bit too bulky and I thought nope I have something else which I can use which is very small and I'm not using it that much uh, as standalone anymore and this is basically the uh, RetroTing 2X that's basically the, the first model the old model classic I think it's not, it's not called a classic and uh, this is actually providing what I was looking for because I want to have a box with the main connections on the back. I, I don't like this kind of spider-like installations like the RetroTing or the OSSC. I really want to have ins and outs on one side and then nothing else. So, and uh, since I'm not using the other functions of the RetroTing, I thought, well, I just get rid of all that stuff and create a very small compact box with my switcher included and then I have one compact unit. And um, I'm going to show you how this basically looks like. And here we are. So I started to well think a little bit uh, how I can make this and uh, I came up with a solution that looks basically like this. So on the back I have my four cable inserts because I'm not going to use uh, sockets. I really want to have the cable soldered directly to this little box and then I just attach the USB and the HDMI. And I want to have a very nice huge switch button on the front. So I came up basically with this and I can show you how this basically looks from the inside. And this is like this. So here in the back of this little device we can see the retro tink and um, in the front we can see the reason why it has this let's say particular shape uh, because this uh, switch requires some space and um, so I started to recreate basically the switch and the retro tink and build all the stuff all around it in order to be able to create something that um, well basically fits to the components and uh, I was really looking to avoid a couple of test prints so I think this is basically the best approach so fingers crossed it, it's going to work and uh, basically to cut a long story short I can show you the result already so this is how it looks at the end it is not assembled yet but uh, this is just to give you a short impression and um, this is my my nice switch and um, it is mechanical locked to four positions and um, so this is how it looks from the inside so this is basically where I want to fit the retro tink into and then um, I route the cables through the bottom of this thingy and going to solder this to my um, switch and at the end hopefully everything will fit together and will switch my video signals quite nicely. So. As a very first thing we have to take apart the retro tink and get rid of a couple of things we are not going to use anymore. And the nice thing is that if I come up with the idea that uh, I want to use this for something else, I can easily add back the components I'm going to remove. Very odd way to disassemble this, but anyway. And Therefore, it's not well wasted. And price wise, since the new RetroTing devices are available, the classic one has been dropped to, I think, about 50 euros, 
dollars or something like this, which is, in my opinion, a fair price for this little device. In my um, in my eyes, the first price of about I think 110, 120 euros was way too much for this um, small amount of, of functionality. But well, anyway, now it's cheaper, and therefore this is something we can really use without having any concerns of wasting some money. So let's get rid of this stuff and. As a first thing, we have to desolder a couple of parts. And since this is basically a bit noisy and not very interesting, I'll be back in a few minutes. So, and it is done. I got all those uh, thingies off the board which was a bit uh, well stressful because as you can see there's a huge ground area on the back of this PCB and everything that is grounded is connected to this so you basically have to sort of heat up this whole uh, PCB to get rid of those uh, sockets and um, as I said this is uh, basically reversible so if I want to use this for something else, then uh, I can sort of well, rebuild this. Anyway, now it's about time to add the cables. And uh, since I built this for a special purpose, basically for my music desk, uh, the uh, switcher will not be centered between, uh, exactly centered between the C64s as a slight offset. So I have uh, cables with two different lengths and the idea is to feed them through those holes and then use a small zipper to keep them in place. So I do not need any additional screws or something like this and I can easily fixate them in this position and then the retro thing will be fitted on top. So it's a bit tight but well it is working and now we have to start with the first cable and um, I just have to think which is going to be number one <laughs> and which is then going to be the second. And uh, I think the idea is to make it like this. So I have two shorts on the right hand side and two longer ones on the left hand side and now we have to remove a little bit of the material here in order to solder this to our switch. This uh, switch is kind of, kind of a funny thing. It took me a while to understand how this is working because you have basically four times three connectors on the outside and three connectors on the inside and by turning the switch you connect the inside pins to the outside pins but uh, you do so in basically in groups so you shift this just around and um, this switch has basically no um, well it has an end and start at an end <laughs> but what I'm going to say is uh, it has basically uh, 12 positions and um, it just repeats doing so I have no idea for what uh, this can be used but um, 
this has created a small issue on my side because I just have four positions and uh, therefore I have created a sort of a little gap. Which I can show you right now. Just enable the knob. And let's go for a different view. There we go. And then here you can see there are some, uh, what do you call this, a notch or something like this. And on the case, there's basically a counterpart. Just here, and uh, so the uh, rotation of this knob is basically limited. So, fingers crossed, this concept is going to work. <laughs> I've never tested this before, but well, it's all about experiencing things. And now we have to figure out why we have five wires basically, one is going to be ground and uh, two are the Y and the C pair and uh, my idea is to connect the ground and the ground of the signals and then have basically just uh, three wires to switch and uh, this is something we have to measure right now and I think we're going to use this socket I just have removed, which makes this whole thing a little bit more accessible. So let's see if I can lead a little, lead a little bit help of my hand here. So that's black, it's fine. Nothing. Ah, it's yellow. That's red. Green and white. So, now we have to figure out what's basically the signal part. So let me just come up with uh, some schematics. So, <laughs> I was able to find the schematics of the uh, socket and uh, now I think we can go and um, start with soldering. So the thing we have to keep in mind is that the way this switch works is that we connect, for example, pin 8. Can you even see it? So pin A is connected in the first position which is like this, to pin 1. And if we switch, then it's connected to 2, to 3, to 4. The same is for pin B. So we connect pin B to uh, 5, 6, 7, 8. And the same for pin C, which is uh, basically 9, 10, 11, 12. So therefore we have to use ABC as output since we want to uh, connect this to the retro thing. But the input cables have to be kind of spider <laughs> their wires to the representative uh, pins on the outside. So therefore I'm going to need a bit more um, cables to work with. And uh, I have to keep in mind that at the end we have to kind of fit this into this uh, sort of small box. 
So let's make some some room. I just hope that at the end the cables are not too short on the outside. That would be a major drawback. Oops. So. Going to need this. So let's remove it. And now Oh, I think there's something missing. Usually, for sessions like this, I have some music. So let's set let's set up some music quite quickly. So now we got everything together. <laughs> we got some music, and now we can have some soldering fun. So, so as I said, the main, main idea is to just uh, combine all the ground connections since the video signal coming from the C64, for example, the YC signal has one combined ground anyway. And as far as I remember, the RGB mod, for example, for the NES uh, is using a combined ground connection as well since the video signal is not created with separated ground con uh, ground base ground connections whatever you want to call this anyway so it is therefore not really required to work basically with all those five wires but uh, they are they, they are there and therefore we have to work with them so and I uh, just want to go through this quite quickly because I already forgot the colors and uh, the main thing I was basically looking for with in this graphics here was to check what's basically the video signal which we obviously can see right now ah here it is so pin 3 is y and pin 4 is c so the top pins are the signal pins and the button pins are the ground pins so white and uh, we are looking on the socket side so we have to turn this around so I have actually pin 3 which is white and pin 4 is red, white and red. So I just have to remember that I have to use this the very same way. Just think what's going to happen when I mix this up. As long as I keep the same scheme, it's probably going to work. So I very much hope so. So white. Then let's start with white as A and 
red as B and all the other stuff is going to be C. So then we have to connect white to pin one of our connector. Oh, here it is. And the other three can be combined to just one. And this is going to be our C. Perhaps a little bit short. It is short. So let's make this a little bit longer so that we have some room to operate. Okay. So now let's put some solder material onto the pins here as well. Oh, indeed, I haven't expected that it's going to be so much. It's a nice thing with 3D printing. Just <laughs> spend some time in your CAD program. Then you send this to the printer and you have to wait a little bit and then basically it's done. And uh, well, it depends on how well the object is created. You have to do some after work or not. So let's switch back to that of you. Let's start with ground on pin 1. Just have to think whether I have to connect something before I go to solder this, because then we are not able to remove the cable any longer. But, well, let's see. So and then we are going to connect this to here and this to ah okay no wrong one two three four five so almost forgot the way the switch works and uh, what I see right now if. If I'm going to connect all the wires on the outside, I have no chance to connect them to the inside any longer. So that's probably something I should do right now. Just thinking what sort of cable I'm going to use. Maybe some... It is indeed short, but uh, some shielded cable would be very nice, I think. So let me quickly grab a cable. So, I wasn't able to find a shielded cable, but at least I found a small cable with three wires and I have prepared this already. And uh, well, actually now I just need to connect this to the uh, respective pins, so to say, and since I already forgot, it's going to be ground, it's going to be white, and the other one is going to be red. So,
be a bit challenging. I'm not really looking forward to the last connections I have to make. It's probably going to be some sort of pita. So, and one thing which is probably going to be very useful is if I'm going to test this with one connection before I do the other, um, just to ensure that uh, I'm working on the right parts, so to say. And um, Well, yeah, I have to connect the socket pin from this side. Basically, a YC cable is some sort of a crossed cable, since you can use it all the way around. So, if you have two sockets face to face, you have to connect the crossed pins. So this is going to be our input. Then this pin has to go to this pin. That's my theory so far. <laughs> and uh, this is supposed to be the right one. There it is, and we have to connect this to the other side, to here. So this is basically right. <laughs> I really hope this is going to work. Short, but hopefully I'm enough. I'm a bit off screen today. And black. Okay, so let's connect the red one to pin 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And then I think I have to test this. before I continue with this stuff. So for this we need an HDMI adapter because the RetroTink is using this sort of strange mini HDMI which is physically a little bit um, sensitive as you may have seen in my repair video from the uh, um, Neo Geo Mini, 
because they are they use the same socket and I already was able to break it so I usually recommend using either adapter cables from mini to standard HDMI or adapters with some flex So that you reduce the stress on this socket because they are sort of hard to repair as well <laughs> so now we need a, a video source and I think I'm going to use my NES for this because it's already here and we have to connect this to HDMI this and this has to go to the NES where's that connector? Yeah. There's indeed a downside of having connections on the back side of devices. We can see it. <laughs> so, and... Well, we need a cartridge for the NES. Otherwise, it won't start. I have no cartridge here. That's weird. Very strange. So, <laughs> so I hope all this stuff is not going up in flames immediately. We need some USB power for the retro thing basically available from here so why see Unsupported signal. So maybe we have mixed Y and C, and then it's not syncing. Oh, my NES isn't starting. How can we check this quite quickly? Uh, we switch over to the Frame Meister. Looks a bit strange, but there's a picture. Okay. So then let's switch back to the S video part. It still states that we have an unsupported signal. So this is connected. This is the correct cable.
It is trying to do something, but... <laughs> Still no real picture. So then let's check whether it is useful to switch Y and C. Maybe there was a mistake in my thinking. Since there are just two video signal wires, or just two video signals, the YC connection or the S video connection, how it is sort of known for, uh, uses color information to create a sync signal. And if we switch the signals, then the sync is missing. And this is probably causing the issue that we're not seeing anything. So, it has changed. Got at least a picture. It looks a bit horrible, but... Um, this is perhaps just a scaling issue. Here we go. So now let's switch back to the retro tink because that's the main thing of this whole exercise. So yeah, the scaling is indeed a bit strange. And it doesn't matter what kind of scaler I'm using. But, uh, well, I have never been a huge fan of the output of the retro tank. But anyway, it looks like that what I trying to attend, actually working. can switch between none source and one source, since I haven't connected all the other things. And uh, now I think it's about time to connect all the other cables and then um, I'll be back quite shortly. This is going to be a sort of boring exercise. And I'm pretty sure you're not going to watch this to the full extent. So, see you soon. So, <laughs> eventually I got everything soldered and uh, already tested it a bit. And uh, as you can see, it's um, a pretty tight experience. And uh, I made already some sort of uh, key learnings through this whole exercise and I think one of the major thing is that if I'm ever going to do something again like this then uh, I, I will make this box a little bit higher to have a bit more space to operate inside the box and uh, perhaps I have to make those cables um, a little bit longer but what I came, what what came to my mind is basically the next time I think I'm going to create a PCB where I can simply solder the sockets onto it and I use pre-manufactured cables. I really hate 
soldering cable stuff and uh, this is uh, basically exactly what I learned through this project as well. Uh, so the last steps will be uh, getting those um, zippers inside to protect the cable against uh, ripping them out and then uh, to just screw in the uh, retro tink and then put everything together so hopefully this is going to be a less stressful exercise now <laughs> This is a little bit like uh, the, the bird and the egg problem, so I, I really have to bring those cables into, let's say, the final position and then I have to lock them there because otherwise I won't be able to get to this part of the box as soon as I have uh, screwed in the retro tink. So fortunately this cable is a little bit longer, which uh, it's going to cause some issues as well, but um, I think I have to live with this. So this works very fine. Yep, this is uh, actually one thing that well happens every now and then. If I create 3D objects in my uh, CAD program, I sort of lose uh, the sense for scale. So I often create things that are basically too small for the real world. <laughs> and um, yeah, I really had to well, maybe add a couple of millimeters here and there to have a bit more space to operate. And uh, well, now I'm paying the price for it, but hopefully when it's done, I'm going to enjoy this. Oops. This has been on my list of things I really need to do for a very long time because the before mentioned combination of this uh, old fashioned switch box and uh, this, this external HDMI converter was always bugging me a bit because it wasn't stable and uh, it got some contact problems after a while. And uh, the, uh, the converter wasn't very good either, I have used then. So I really thought I really need to create something else. And then uh, I started to work on this project. And the, the, the 3D design worked quite well. So uh, I went very smoothly through the whole a construction process and um, then I thought okay let's let's print sort of a prototype to see if uh, everything fits and uh, what you see here right now is actually the prototype so uh, usually in my experience it takes a couple of attempts until everything fits as expected but this time it uh, worked very well I think uh, it's going to be close. Those uh, zippers are a bit higher than uh, the final position of the retro thing will be. So maybe the lid won't close completely.
So, what to do with this cable? I'm sorry for this bad presentation, <laughs> but there's actually really no no space left to make this a little bit nicer. <laughs> So now it looks like it, it will fit, it's great. So I already prepared a couple of screws I want to use, which I found somewhere in a box. And the strange thing is they have uh, not a crisscross, not four, whatever you want to call this, they have three. Something we know from Nintendo, but these are not Nintendo screws. But I got the right bit for it. So that we can finally get them in. And now, fingers crossed, this will close <laughs> the way I have planned it. Because now I'm not able to adjust the position of the cable any longer. So it really has to fit. Still something that Perfect. It is tight. It is really tight. So, yeah, it would have been a good idea to make the box a little bit bigger. But, well, it is the way it is right now. There's some tension inside, I think that's because there are basically just too many cables. I just hope I'm not going to break something. I will see when we're going to test this. charge my magic screw and my sonic screwdriver so it's closed looks okay -ish. Let's see if everything still working. <laughs> so So 
and we can see the NES and it's for real I can operate this then there should be nothing nothing and the C64 so far so good let's test the other ones C64 and the fourth one C64 here we go I'm really really happy that this has worked so far and I still can switch through the input modes not making a huge difference but uh, at least there we go the four-way YC2 HDMI switcher is ready to use it's done I'm really happy that this is um, completed now I haven't expected that it's going to be so much hassle in between that it takes so long uh, to put all those stuff together and um, as I said the next thing is going to be a little bit higher to have more room inside and uh, perhaps I really come up with a sort of adapter PCB so that I really just need to plug in the cables and then uh, everything is ready to use. Well, anyway, that's finally, eventually, the end of this episode. Thank you very much for watching. If you have any ideas, questions, comments whatsoever, feel free to use the comment section. I'm really looking forward. And then um, I will probably put this design on uh, Prusa printers so uh, for for download and for uh, improvements whatsoever you have in mind and then um, as soon as I have my whole setup just behind me uh, put together then uh, I will make an episode what this little device is basically uh, in control of it's going to be in control of and then uh, this is, yep, the end. Thanks for watching. <laughs> See you for the next episode. Bye-bye. <laughs>